Welcome back to Light the Fuse, the only Mission Impossible podcast that will not be slowed down by a global pandemic. This is Drew Taylor, once again joined by Charles Hood. Hello. How you feeling, Charles? How you doing? What's going on? Tell me everything. I feel good. I feel really good. And and, and I'm, I'm grateful for, for Kevin's legally dissimilar main theme that we have that played at the beginning of the podcast. You know, we haven't talked about it in a while. I feel like we always talk about his uh, his uh, his ripoff music of the plot. Well, you know, we're trying to get him sued. So that's the surefire way, you know. Yeah. I feel like he's bought it like this pandemic has kind of bought him some time because they're just not that interested. But yeah, they need to hunker down and do their jobs and. Get this guy in court. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> we are very excited about today's episode because we are. this is the first part of the Michael Kaplan interview. Yeah. And he was a delight. Yeah, he's... I, I just feel like you can't overstate how important he is to... I, I just feel like he's contributed so much to the look of so many movies over the years. Yes, classic movies yeah he's not really brought up that much which is very odd to me given how much he's done and he's i don't think he hasn't won an oscar either which is insane that seems like an accounting error or something i mean (laughs) i mean it's crazy it's really it's really crazy i mean the amount of stuff that he's done the amount of movies we talk about even in this episode which we we don't want to spoil but we get into his other his catalog his back catalog let's say yeah um and it just is, he has like a, he's had an impact on culture. Yeah, I mean, I think you can you can draw direct, direct parallels to the the styles that he's introduced in the movies, and then what's been sort of replicated in mainstream fashion. And that's that's sort of like also something cool that he like you don't need ten thousand dollars to kind of look like you're being dressed by Michael Kaplan. You can kind of futz it and and make it your own, and it's, it's really cool. And we'll we'll get into it in the interview and maybe wrap it up afterwards. But you know, the types of movies he's done run the gamut. I mean, it's really incredible. It really is. And and, and I don't know if I just looked this up and uh, is this real? He's never even been nominated for an Oscar. Really? That just seems wrong. That just seems way wrong. I just don't even understand how that's possible. Yeah. That doesn't seem right. But the guy did the costumes for Blade Runner. Let's just start from there. And then, you know, you'll hear us talk about all the other titles he's done too. It's pretty insane. It's crazy. I mean, this guy is, he's a tour de force and one of the nicest people in the world and so generous with his time. And, uh, and he brought along concept art. He brought, he brought a giant box of stuff that he was delivering to the Academy Museum. Yeah. It should also be noted that he looked really cool. Like he was dressed. Yes. Very cool. (laughs) um uh yeah and we're gonna post um the ones that are mentioned this week we'll post and the ones that are mentioned next week as our in part two of our interview we'll post those on our social media on twitter and instagram which which is at light the fuse pod yeah including one photo that we neither of us had seen before and blew our minds which we will be sharing next week so we can't talk about yet but yeah keep an eye out for that but yeah without further ado we'll we'll uh hand it over to him and then we'll be back after the show to wrap it up Great. Well, thank you so much for being here, Michael. It's you are you've always been on the top of our list. So you're actually yeah. our first costume designer. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we're obviously fans of a lot of the costume designers, but you're top of our list. I mean, this is... Colleen won't return our calls. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we... <laughs> She's a busy lady. She is, yeah. <laughs> we kind of touched on this earlier, but, but we wanted to start by asking you about that amazing pre-production photo of Tom at the top of the Dubai, about the top of the tower, and about how you were the one that suggested not to wear a suit, but just to go out there in jeans and a t-shirt. And, sh- and where did the shoelessness come from? Was that you too? Yes. Okay. Can yes. you talk about that? I'm surprised you know that. Well, we talked to David James, who uh-huh. took that photo, and he said that Tom was ready to go in the suit, and that you told him, get out of the suit and put on something more casual. So, where did that come from? Well, Tom's, you know, a cool, sexy, young guy. Uh, not as young as he used to be, but who is? <laughs> and... Um, I just thought, you know, being up there on on top of, uh, you know, a hotel, 
uh, in this kind of um, tuxedo would kind of make him look like, um, what's the name of the Vegas hotelier? Uh, Wynn. St- yeah, I Steve actually Hill. said that to Tom and he <laughs> looked at me um, kind of sh- sh- shocked that I said it. I said, you look like Steve Wynn, you know, in a tuxedo <laughs> on top of a hotel. And so he said, okay, well, what do you think I should wear? And I said, well, I said, I think it'd be really cool if you're just, you know, wearing t-shirts and jeans and barefoot. And he said, that sounds good. So uh, I don't know if a lot of people contradict Tom, but I kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> I think with age, you kind of just say what's on your mind. And if he didn't want to, you know, I mean, he, he was free to do it at whatever he wanted, of course. But I just thought it would be, uh, you know, uh, I thought he'd look better, just young and casual and, you know, like uh, just showing up like that. Yeah. Did you have any relationship with Mission Impossible, the TV show? Were you a fan of the show or the previous movies or anything like that? I was a big fan of the show. You really? Know, yeah. I mean, I, I've since done uh, the costumes for uh, Star Wars, and uh, I also did the costumes for Star Trek. And I think of the three, I uh, was like an avid viewer of Mission Impossible. That's awesome. Uh, Star Wars, you know, of course, I I saw and loved, you know, the first three films. uh, But I never saw them again and again the way, way, you know, diehard fans do. And also, I was never a Trekkie. In fact, when J.J. asked me to do Star Trek, I I said, no, I'm not the right person. And uh, (laughs) told my agent to send my regrets. And uh, um, he... uh, called back and said, well, would Michael just meet with me and discuss it? And as soon as as soon as we started talking and uh, he laid out his plans and told me how he thought, you know, I was definitely the right person, even though I didn't think so. You know, I mean, he charmed me into doing it. And I'm, <laughs> I'm really glad I did, because I think the thing that was keeping me from doing it was uh, was fear of the fan base and feeling I wouldn't do a good job. But JJ kind of, uh, you know, is 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 so kind of supportive and uh, charming, and um, you know, he he kind of uh, is able to kind of uh, paint the road for you, so that you know you you can become as fearless as as he seems. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and so the show, did that inform at all? I mean, you, you said you're a fan of the old show. Did that inform at all what you brought to this project, at, to Ghost Protocol? Um, did that, did that well, I knew, the, I knew the characters so well, and I, I was just a big fan of it. And um, I, don't, I don't think so. I think I um, did what I always do, uh, no matter what the project is, if it's... Uh, you know, something I did recently, which was uh, The Alienist, which was a TV series, um, a limited series, uh, and it was based on one of my favorite books, uh, and it was uh, 1896, about a serial killer, which is a far cry from a lot of the other things that I've done, but I approach every every movie the same way, you know, a comedy like Christmas Vacation. Um, you know, I read the script and that becomes my Bible and I, I uh, try to illuminate what I've read and, and, you know, get a mental picture while I'm reading it and uh, all these ideas, you know, uh, go through my head and, uh, you know, I, I just try to uh, make the characters come alive and uh, dress them accordingly, you know, so the script is, is you know, the, the common denominator for every department head. Right. That original script for Christmas Vacation, John Hughes is known for making very, very long scripts and then they shoot a lot and then whittle it back a lot. Was that a really long script, <laughs> that one? Do I you recall? I don't think so. I think it was pretty pretty much what it was. Oh, wow. Okay. I loved kind of delineating some of the characters that were just, you know, written on the page, but... Cousin Eddie and uh, some of the fun that I had with his costumes, like the the the, the dicky he wears, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know the the co- costume he wears when he's uh, emptying the shitter. You know, I mean, shitter was full. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, uh, he was such a f- and and you know the 
he was he was just such a, a fun character to dress and uh you know w- with who they cast i mean uh <laughs> and um you know i just i just had so much fun with that and yeah. um all the characters all the characters so are you uh so you love doing comedies yeah so well like i wanted to also bring up just while we're talking about comedies quickly clue is one of my favorite movies as well and you did the costumes for that. Those are, I mean, iconic characters to bring to life in a movie. You know, Mrs. Peacock and all those amazing costumes. Yeah, what, they're what? doing another one. Yeah. Um, they're, they're trying to get it off the ground. Yeah, and, I don't know how uh, I feel about that. I would love to... <laughs> do it again? Do it again. Really? Yeah. I mean, that cast for the original one and the way you dressed them. Oh, Madeline Kahn and yeah. Eileen Brennan. And Michael McKeon. It was... I mean, it was everybody. Tim Curry. Yeah. There are Leslie Ann Warren. I mean, there are so many great people in that. And you, the way you had to make them in such distinct costumes, obviously, from the board game. Did you know that um, that's when I first met Carrie Fisher because she was cast as Miss Scarlet? Really? Yes. And uh, we had this crazy fitting. She had everyone in hysterics. We didn't get very much done. But uh, the in next hysterics. thing I knew, uh, the, the production called me and told me that um, Miss Scarlet was being recast and Carrie was... Uh, you know, going to deal with some personal problems. Oh, and I no. think that's why we had so much fun because I think she was, uh, uh, you know, she was drinking at the time. Not drinking. Her, other uh, things. Uh, yeah. think she other talked things, about it in her book and stuff other like that. Things. Yeah. yeah, it's all it's all been discussed. So I'm not telling secrets out of yeah, school. Yeah. But um, she was amazing, and um, I really was so sorry that I didn't have that opportunity to work with her. And then I, you know, would go to birthday parties at her house and uh, oddly enough as a costume designer that was fascinating because she lives in Edith Head's old house oh. she, she did wow and um, and then of course I had the uh, the great opportunity to, to work with her on Star Wars and yeah. um, go back to the house and do fittings and um, meet her mom and um, you know I really miss her a lot she, she was uh, you know an, an amazing woman yeah, and what's amazing, you did all three of the new trilogy. Yeah, yeah. J- JJ brought me on, and uh, then I met with Kathy, and um, she okayed his uh, his choice. Uh, and halfway through uh, episode seven, um, Kathy said, uh, "I guess she liked what I was doing because she asked if I would stay on and and uh, do the other two. So that felt really, really great. Was there any kind of difference in working relationship with Ryan or JJ? I mean, I mean, was that very much so, very much so. Um, but like I said, you know, as, as I um, use the script as kind of the Bible uh, and kind of take my cues from that, I also, you know, didn't, you know, I, I, I kind of uh, just moved on to the new director and his choices and. Uh, uh, and his his vision, and it was very different than JJ's, as uh, you know, as the movie shows. But uh, uh, he also wrote it, so uh, as JJ did, you know, uh, episode seven. So it's it's really nice to work with uh, a writer director because uh, there's no questions they can't answer. You know, I mean, about the script. Uh, right. You know, Fincher was that way also, even though he wasn't always writing uh, the projects he worked on. But you could ask him. Um, uh, how much, you know, if you wanted to dress somebody appropriately and, and not make them, you know, uh, look out, out of their uh, income bracket, you could ask Fincher uh, um, how much money this person has and, and he would, you know, without missing a beat, tell you exactly what they earn. and you know, <laughs> So you'd have a wow. complete picture. Yeah. 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 So he's a very thought out guy. Did you work with Trevor o at all for nine? If you, if you were there for all three? No. I met with him. Okay. And we had a few discussions, but it didn't go any further than that. Right. Right. That was uh, at his early, early yeah. days. And so as your usual process, you read the script and you come up with some designs that you propose to the director and then adjust from there? Is that I typically how it works? read the script and then after I have a, a, an idea, I usually then meet with the director and, and listen before I go on record with my ideas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about Ghost Protocol. Yes. Um, this, we love this movie so much. This is The movie really got us started doing this podcast because we saw it together in, in New York at the IMAX Theater at Lincoln Square. And 
We've been yeah. obsessed with the series ever since. Um, which I mean, there's so many. I want to ask o- about the, to talk about. I want to ask about the Russia switcheroo from his his captain's uniform to the like tourist look and the Bruce Springsteen. And, yeah, shirt. and the Bruce Springsteen shirt. Did you have to? First of all, did you? Did Bruce have to clear that shirt? They had to clear it. Okay, that was my own T-shirt, which I still have. What? <laughs> what? You should have worn it. <laughs> <laughs> but I am wearing it. Yeah, you are. Right. Uh, did you like? Was were all those mechanics kind of built into the suit so he could tear it away and do the you know changeover and all that? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, they just told me that he had to you know make a quick change from that. So it was it was my idea to to do it in a way where the clothes were you know. The uniform was breakaway, and uh, uh, they just thought he would wear something underneath the uniform. And I said, well, why doesn't he just turn it inside out, and we'll do this. It's much more interesting to have this. Uh, it's it's much more like the, the TV series where yeah. it's yeah. kind of an integral, you know, thought out idea, concept. Right. Well, and I love him tearing the stripes off the pants. Yeah. yeah. Like just, I mean, it's all just in all of the one yeah. shot. He's able to just kind of do those. Yeah. And Tom, I think was, uh, was, uh, you know, I knew Tom would be able to do it because of the way his mind works. And he's, he's, he's so great at hitting, hitting, you know, marks and, and, uh, you know, doing things that are choreographed like that. And so, you know, he had to do it over and over again, and you know, I, I don't think he ever got it wrong. You know, with the the Velcro and yeah, yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, I like that moment. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Do you have uh, the, well, the uh, the suit that he wears with the the gloves. I, I mean, I don't I think that maybe Chris Peck, the, the props guy, did he do the gloves? But did you do the suit that accompanies it? Yeah, yeah, we worked together, okay. and uh, the gloves were pretty high, and Tom wanted to wear a tank top. And um, once again, I opened my big mouth and said, you're going to wear like kind of elbow length gloves with a tank top. You'll look like Holly Golightly. Um, (laughs) So, uh, you know, suddenly I didn't hear about the tank top again. (laughs) But he got his tank top in the Russia scene. Yeah. 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 No, he looks great in a tank top. It was just with those gloves. Yeah. You know, it wasn't really... uh, well, we you brought uh, a box of amazing artifacts from this movie, and some of the the sort of artwork has him in a full suit, like with a tie blowing in the wind. Yeah, um, and with the gloves. Yeah, with the gloves. Can you talk about the evolution of that as well? Um, I think he wanted. To, he just had it in his mind to wear something more tech, you know. And um, I don't remember. You guys seem to know more about this movie than I do. I was <laughs> on it for like a year, but. Um, it could have been, um, just, uh, logistics, but I think maybe in an earlier draft, he was, uh, didn't have time to change. Okay. And then, that makes sense. then it became, uh, something that he knew he had to do. And so he was prepared. Right. So Great. I, I think that that's what what the reasoning was why I had him in initially drawn in, in a, a suit for that yeah yeah I also thought it would be cool but you know not very practical you know like it also must have been right. a, would have been a pain in the ass I'm sure with continuity and everything with the tide blowing oh, 800 yeah. directions yeah. And, yeah 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 uh, we should talk about Paula Patton's dress ah. which is amazing that green dress I feel like uh there have been some iconic dresses in the series. Yes. Colleen Atwood did one for Maggie Q. And you I did love one. that red dress that, yeah. that Colleen did. Did that inform at all I this I wish one? I could take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> did that inform? You know, did you have to think about that one and make sure you're doing something different from it? Or, I mean, why green? I mean, I'm just any thoughts about that? Uh, I like green a lot. I, I put... Uh, I did the costumes for burlesque, and um, I put... Uh, Christina Aguilera oh. uh, wears this beautiful green dress that's kind of like an acid green. And Miss Scarlet wears like a, a teal uh, green, blue dress. And I don't know. There's, I think it's, it's an underused color. And so uh, I also thought that this shade of green was so beautiful on Paula. Um, 
and she was I knew she was going to be in it a while and I wanted it to be a really complimentary color but I also wanted it to have a, a, a strong wow factor when you first see her which I think it does yeah climbing out of that car yeah. well it's such yeah. a great variety of costumes she gets to wear I mean I think I think the opening of the movie she started with like a baseball cap and like you know she's just has a really great um, variety of, of wardrobe in yeah. that movie. Uh, when you put Tom in the hoodie, did you think, oh, this is going to be on every poster on, and everything? Because that became this like kind of iconic image associated with the movie. Yeah. You knew. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you well, just knew. Also, also um, you know, he's, it's, it's at a moment when he's kind of on the run and hiding mm-hmm. out. And yeah. I wanted a hood. And rather than just put him in a hoodie, you know, I thought something leather was cool. And, and uh, uh, when I saw it on him with the hood up and the way it framed his face, uh, I, I, I don't know if he's ever done that before. Um, I don't yeah, think he has. I don't think so. Maybe but I think there, there's one moment in uh, Minority Report where he has a hooded sweatshirt. Uh, that's right. Yeah. But it, it looked so great on him. Yeah. It yeah. framed his face so nicely. And the fact that it was... Uh, you know, not some some cloth hoodie, but just some you know, like a, a leather hoodie was was uh, very dramatic, and um, you know, I, th- I thought it was a great. Look a lot of famous my... Michael Kaplan leather jackets. Yeah, you, you, have, that's you, like, know, you know, you know when you see a Michael Kaplan it's, leather jacket. It's really when you look at your filmography. We we're just talking about this before you got here. Like, I you know they're like auteur directors and auteur cinematographers, but I think they're also auteur costume designers, and that's like you can see this is Michael Kaplan, like. Yeah. Blade Runner, Seven, Fight Club, like these, all these iconic, you know, things. And, and Ghost Protocol has that same kind of feel yeah. to it with the with the leather. Do you Thank have any, you. any? I mean, uh, is that? Do you wear a lot of leather? You, well, I never put leather on. Um, you know, I, I'm always directed by by the script, so it's not like I, I need to get a leather jacket in when I can. But um, you know, it just made a lot of sense that Tyler Durden would be wearing a leather jacket, and I thought. You know, dry blood color was a was a, <laughs> was, was a good choice for him, and um, you know, and Brad Brad um, wears a, a really cool like leather car coat on um, in in the movie Seven right. that I did, and uh, the reason I chose that shape of a jacket was so that it would go over his suit. You know, we wouldn't put him in a motorcycle jacket as a young rookie cop because. He was required to wear, um, you know, as a detective, he needed to wear suits. But I, I wanted him because of all the rain and everything. I didn't think, I wanted Morgan Freeman to wear the raincoat, and I didn't want them both running around in raincoats. And so, you know, I put Brad in a, a, a you know, a cool leather 60s car coat that he would have gotten at a thrift shop. And uh, he also wore suits that, um, there's a couple scenes where he gets up and he just, he puts his shirt and tie on at the same time over his head as if he were putting a t-shirt on. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's how he thinks of clothes. He's only wearing a suit because he needs to, you know, because that's what uh, the job requirements are. Right. Uh, but he still puts it on like, you know, like a, a t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> that's one of my favorite with, moments. With yeah. the tie already yeah, tied. Tie, yeah, tie. Well, he's yeah. got that hanger full of all the different ties that are already tied. Was that in the script or was that an no. idea you had? I... I yeah, oh, really? it was all character driven. It's such a great character. And moment. all the ties are kind of like different sports. Like one's basketball, one's football. Has little footballs on it. <laughs> so it's wow. kind of, you know, if you notice it, fine. If you don't notice it, fine. But it's just stuff that is uh, my way of character developing. <laughs> yeah, what's well, so, I mean, it, the wardrobe that you chose for Seven? To me, one of the best things about that movie is the dichotomy between those two characters, Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman. And you just see it in their costumes. Um, and that's, yeah, and the way that they approach everything. So it makes sense that it would be in their costumes as well between those characters. Oh, you know, another good leather jacket, as you did, Long Kiss Goodnight. Gina Davis is when she becomes a badass. Yeah. She, she puts the tape over the bullet hole. Another yeah. great leather jacket. Just sorry. Just, <laughs> just, <laughs> I had to interject with that. I had to interject with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nobody talks about that movie. I love Gina Davis. Oh, we love that, that movie. movie rules. That's a great. I mean, we, we're big Shane Black fans, so that's a great. We like that movie a lot. <laughs> She's please, great. Please continue on your seven. What are you going to say about seven? Morgan Freeman and, and Brad Pitt differences. Yeah, I don't remember. I lost my train of thought oh, about it. Uh, it's my fault. 
<laughs> Shouldn't have brought up that. Gina Davis. Gina I'm, Davis. Glad, I'm it. glad you did. God damn it. <laughs> well, I like the image. There's like the hat that you have from Morgan Freeman and the and the, the trench coat that he's got. It's just like more of old school. Yeah, old you know, old, old school, and then this young young uh, you know rookie you know detective kind of. Uh, coming in and Morgan getting ready to t- retire. I just kind of love that and, and I wanted to, you know, exemplify it in in the, the clothes. Yeah. I love that scene when um, Brad asks uh, Morgan if he wants a glass of wine and he fills it to the brim <laughs> and Morgan's look is priceless. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> That's... It's amazing. I love that movie so much. I know. What, what, Fincher's, you, Fincher's pretty brilliant. And also Brad ad libs. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know um, whose idea that filling up the wine glass like that was. But, you know. <laughs> Such a great It's touch. like a normal glass, too, right? It's not a wine glass. I don't I remember, remember. But uh, he fills it up to the top as though it were a beer, you know? <laughs> and uh, I remember when he's. He's bringing. He's talking to Morgan. He said, "Oh, he said, I, you know, I got this book about the 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 Marquis de Chade." Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and then just yeah, the character work in that movie. Is so this a, it's just so is this good. a seven podcast? It is a seven. Okay. Podcast. Well, that's how. But so David Fincher is there, like uh, working with him. He's uh, it's actually similar to we've heard about Tom Cruise that Fincher really demands a lot out of the people who he works with. Like he brings out the best in them, I would I would say. I think so. Um, what was it like working with David Fincher? I love working with directors who are visual, and um, I was spoiled very early on. Not my first film, but when I did, uh, you know, soon after, um, you know, I did Blade Runner with Ridley Scott, and and that's kind of what confirmed that I made the right choice to be in the film industry because you really saw the clothes you really were inspired when Ridley came to the department and did just a you know which was infrequent but he would do a few little sketches and inspire you you know for you know the next couple weeks to kind of uh, you know take his ideas and expound upon them and uh, and then um, shortly after well my next film after that was Flashdance and it was another Brit Adrian Lyne, and they both came out of commercials, as did Fincher, well, music videos more than commercials, but both. So, uh, you know, there's there was something about that uh, type of uh, director who would be telling stories visually uh, as well as, you know, with the screenplay. And, um, you know, the details were very important, and they expected a lot from, from the designer, and so to be you know, in that mindset and included in in their work. You know, it was so much more collaborative than um, a lot of other projects I've worked on where the director just feels, well, you're doing the clothes and I'm directing it and I'm, you know, there there's something about, you know, being heard and, and you know, being appreciated uh, for the details or ideas you're, you're kind of coming up with uh, outside of, you know, the uh, basic job delineation right. you bring up flash dance i should ask quickly because there's iconic stuff in flash dance as well the shoulder you know she has her sweatshirt over her shoulder i mean <laughs> was that that was new wasn't it was that something that you I well mean, i didn't invent it um but it, you know once again i read the script and you have this lady welder who doesn't have a lot of money she is uh wanting very much to become a classical or a dancer going to you know ballet school or modern dance school and uh, and uh, she also reads fashion magazines so the sweatshirt makes sense for her day job as a welder I used to um, when I was in art school go to uh, the Pennsylvania Ballet Company which was uh, right on the same campus where uh, I was going to art school and so I used to draw from the ballerinas, maybe a little pretentious, kind of thinking I was uh, a young Degas. But um, <laughs> um, I would go to these classes and do these quick sketches. And I noticed all the dancers would, uh, you know, want to keep their muscles warm. And so they wore a lot of sweat clothes and leg warmers, but they would cut them so that they would have, you know, maneuverability. And you know, they'd, they'd stay warm, but they'd be, you know, cutting things so that they could... Uh, 
move. And so that's where that cut sweatshirt came from, from the world of, of uh, dance and ballerinas. And also it made sense because um, it was more of a fashionable thing to do than just wearing, you know, a construction worker's sweatshirt. Right. So it made sense when she was reading her Italian Vogue during her lunch break that she would kind of do something, you know, have an eye or her mind thinking about what's going on in the world of fashion. So right. combining those three different worlds, you know, that was the, the one garment that I thought she could afford that would make sense and, and indicate all those uh, different worlds. There's also an iconic moment in Flashdance where she takes off her bra underneath her shirt. Mm -hmm. Was that in the script or where, you know, where did that come from? I don't think it was in the script. I think it was something that Adrian said he wanted to do. Right. And um, he said she's she's going to, you know, come home and seduce him and um, put on something more comfortable. So rather than it be a, a bathrobe, I think the sweatshirt, I think it all just evolved on the set. I don't think it was in the script. Yeah. I don't remember, but, uh, you know, the, the baggy sweatshirt really made it very easy for her to, to do that. Yeah. You know, that became the poster for the film. Yeah. Yeah. And people are still wearing it, the, the sweatshirt, that way. Yeah. Yeah. What is it, it was, like to it was see... When the, a lot of uh, the guys in San, on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood started doing it. That, <laughs> it really became a huge... <laughs> well, what is it like seeing something that you have designed go into the world, you know, sort of be absorbed by the culture like that? Either, you know, people dressing like it for Halloween or even, you know, adopting it, like you said, just in the mainstream. Is, it, is there like a real sense of gratification there? Yeah, it was on the cover of Newsweek. I mean, it was like insane. Right. Wow. You know, and I had like a, a Japanese, uh, uh, I don't know if it was a, like a sportswear company asking if I would do a line and... You know, um, wow. you know, a, a lot of stuff going on. And it was like not only sweeping the nation, but I mean, it was, uh, you know, a, kind of a, a worldwide thing. Right. Which was uh, which was pretty incredible. I mean, you're still doing that, though. I mean, I see pe people at, you know, Comic-Con dressed like Laura Dern from Star Wars. And that's that's you. You know, it's like you still are putting that stuff out. I mean, is there is there a drive to kind of contribute to the culture like that, or, or is it just specifically for the movie and then whatever else happens? Not at all. No, it's just for the movie, and yeah. it's kind of what what I feel like I'm paid to do, and is right. is to make these characters come alive in a in a way that makes sense. That's that's um, also something you haven't seen before, something fresh mm -hmm. and and uh, correct for the script, and yet not boring. And um, people have interviewed me for jobs and say well you know with our film we're trying to set a trend like you set on um <laughs> you know flash dance oh you know and i think well first of all the responsibility is on you to do a a, a huge hit movie <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, there you go. Michael Kaplan, genius, gentleman, fashion icon. Wow. I love talking about the the quick change, you know, the quick change outside the Kremlin. Yeah. And how that was how that was his Bruce Springsteen shirt. Yeah. That was amazing. Um, and the and the the art that we discuss of um, Paul Patton's green dress and the gecko gloves, the concept art for that, we'll be posting those so you can check those out online. Uh, we'll also on Instagram, Twitter. We we also are on the Mission Impossible Reddit page a lot. We post that stuff on there, um, and Facebook as well. Yeah, so keep saying nice things about us because that's really it. Really feeds us. <laughs> keeps us going uh, yeah. and we also he talked a little bit about Star Wars this week I think right he did talk about Star Wars this week but I think he talks about it more next week I wanted week. to bring up what's that yeah he talked about he talked about Snoke next week so, so. okay yes, he talks about Snoke right yeah I wanted to bring up just the uh, the Star Wars controversy that, that we stirred up recently in our Marianne Brandon and, and Mary Jo Markey <sighs> episode god <laughs> I'm just embarrassed I'm embarrassed about this I, I mean some of the news outlets that were covering it covered it fully, and then there were some that left out quotes. I thought it was really unfair because Marianne specifically 
said very complimentary things about Ryan Johnson, about what he did and, and how what he did was a, a really interesting uh, approach to the Star Wars movie. And and then some of the some of the uh, news outlets or like even on Twitter, some Star Wars people were just tweeting out the quote without full context. And that that bugged me. And, and there were even a couple of sites that were just totally misquoting Mary Jo and saying that she was calling Mary Ann a liar, which was wrong. It was like they were quoting something that, that you had said and saying it. It was just it, it was just such a mess. It didn't make any sense. And, and clearly Mary Jo was not calling out Mary Ann for lying. It was just completely taken out of context and was really stupid. It made me feel really bad because they were amazing and they had so many other amazing things to say. And I mean, they are clearly dedicated to J.J. Abrams, a filmmaker who they worked with multiple times. Yeah. And who they did not work on the, you know, Last Jedi. And, um, yeah, I thought it was kind of bizarre and it really sucks. I hate, I hate this discussion of <laughs> The Last Jedi versus the other movies. And I, I know that we've both taken part in it to varying degrees uh, over the last few months, but it, uh, it just bums me out a lot and it really... It really upset me that this started that whole conversation again. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm but glad it people, is what it is. I yeah, mean, I hope people listen to the podcast, the whole thing, and got more out of it. Yeah, listen to the whole show. Yeah. It's crazy how there's just so many, like, there are people who hate The Last Jedi, and then there are the people who really support The Last Jedi, and it's... There's just like battle lines are drawn, and on Twitter we were we were like tagged in this a couple of different uh, tweets where like people just went off for days back and forth, screaming at each other about <laughs> about Star Wars. Yeah, I it was funny because somebody I think Scott Wampler from uh, Birth Movies Death um, did this funny tweet about how we are gonna be you know <laughs> we're gonna be forced to deal with another six months of relitigating Star Wars. Uh, and he put the little the demon uh, from the Eddie Murphy SNL that thing that he creates in the cooking show sketch. <laughs> yeah, that and was I, I I stupidly waded in and said, "Whoa, what what's going on?" And then somebody said, "This is your fault, man." And it was you know, <laughs> yeah, it was about our podcast. Yeah, it was terrible because <laughs> so. we 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 kicked up the conversation. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, look, everybody has their own opinion. I mean, I know you love The Last Jedi. I really like The Last Jedi. I think it's the most interesting of the new Star Wars movies. And, um, you know, I wasn't a big fan of, of, of Rise of Skywalker, but I really, really liked Force Awakens. Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't, it's just, that it was, it was, I think like what Mary, Marianne Brandon and, 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 uh, and Mary Jo said that it should have been one filmmaker that did all three. It was just a mess. Yeah. I mean, you and I have also talked about though, that the fact that the original trilogy does not, is not exactly the most cohesive either. That's true. Um, although <laughs> That's you very had, true. you had Lucas guiding things, but even him, the the other Jedi that are that's referenced in the second movie was supposed to be an entirely separate character, and then by the end of the third movie, he was so exhausted by the whole process, he said, "Ah, fuck it, it's Leia," and then <laughs> right. you know that was it. <laughs> uh, Star Wars is fun; it, it's going to go on forever. There's going to be a hundred more movies. We have no reason to get hung up on one or two right now. You know, right. let's just plow ahead and uh, whatever. I, I'm glad people talked about us, but I wish that. I wish it had been in more in a more positive context, but maybe Michael Kaplan talking about the leggings in Flashdance will put us back in the conversation in a big way. That's that's all I can hope, you know. Well, and next week he reveals something that I guess we shouldn't say quite yet, but he sh we we'll, we will be posting pictures next week of of a costume test of a portion of Ghost Protocol that that never got filmed, and it's pretty fucking awesome. Yeah, that is we our minds were blown when we saw that. Because we had no idea how close it came to being shot. Yeah. Uh, very close, it turns out. But until then, if you want to help us out, please sign up for our Patreon, which is uh, patreon.com forward slash light the fuse. Buy a t-shirt on our Tee Public page. I think there's, a, there's all these sales going on right now, so there's no excuse. And if you could just follow us on, on whatever social media platforms you're on, light the fuse pod. Or, you know, just write a review on iTunes. It would be hugely helpful. Tell your friends about us. I know you're stuck at home and bored. And you could do worse things than spend 30 minutes with us, I think. I don't know about you, Charles. That might be like a death sentence uh, in your in your mind. But <laughs> I think that... No, we need, we need your support. We do. Uh, to make this possible. To do this uh, every week. 
you know that's 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 why we have to split up the episodes because for every minute our podcast is the longer the podcast episode the more it costs us to get it made and that's why we keep our episodes short and uh yeah so anything you can do to help us whether it's buying a shirt or a magnet or um signing up on the patreon or t- telling someone who you think might want to sign up for the patreon um all that really helps um and if you can't afford that then then spread the word and and, and uh help us get this podcast out there more yes thank you guys so much and we have so many kick-ass episodes coming up do we want to tease anything charles Oh yeah, you have no idea how many people we have coming up. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I still know the full order yet, but obviously we have our 100th episode coming up, which we're working on, trying to get something special. A few different things in the works. We'll see if any of them come to fruition. Um, and then we also have a uh, a composer coming up. We've got a seven time Oscar winning sound guy. We've got. Um, a screenwriter who did not work on yes. uh, any Mission Impossible movies, but she's a very prominent screenwriter who's done um, some big, big movies, and, and is uh, you'll be excited to hear her thoughts on on the Mission Impossible series. That was a fun talk. We've talked to so many people I can't even remember who. It's insane. We have so many to. stocked up, and and so yeah. Oh, well, somebody who is incredibly involved in the Mission Impossible two soundtrack. Oh yeah, that was great. Yeah. Yeah, so for for the we'll be releasing that around the 20th anniversary of MI2, which is May 24th, was when uh, Mission Impossible 2 came out 20 years ago. So that'll be a really fun. We're gonna do some stuff, fun stuff for MI2's 20th anniversary that you'll really like. Yeah, the soundtrack talk was crazy because this guy produced the album. You know, he got Limp Bizkit and Metallica and all these people to do songs for the movie. It's insane. Yeah, he is a complete character. Yeah, and I love him. And I tried to sort of like prep Charles for talking to him and I don't think Charles was prepared it's basically a monologue this entire episode but it is so engaging so funny uh you're gonna love it I think I hope I think people are gonna love it yeah I think so yeah uh, also this uh, episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon and it was uh, mixed and edited by Luke Burson and a special thank you to Jacob from Holland hi Jacob <laughs> and I also wanted to quickly uh, say that we, we we did a live watch of Mission Impossible Fallout and had a lot of people uh, tweeting along with us while we did that a couple weeks ago. And tonight we're doing Rogue Nation. And if it goes well, then we'll continue to do the other mission movies. So if you're on Twitter, then you should join us. Or if you're not on Twitter, then you should join join Twitter and join us uh, in, in live watching these movies as a group. It's a really fun experience. You know, hopefully, hopefully we'll have some more special guests tonight if somebody shows up. But you know. Oh yeah, that's the thing. If you didn't know, uh, when we did Fallout, Christopher McQuarrie showed up and answered ten questions, and we have a whole. Um, he showed up in the middle of the live tweet and he direct messaged us and was like, "Hey, I'm up late and uh, I'm li- watching the live watch with you. Uh, I'll take ten questions." So we had people um, ask him questions. It was awesome. And uh, we have a whole Patreon episode about that, recapping it and, and reading his questions and answers. So, uh, yeah, that's another another reason to sign up for the Patreon. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't wait. So until next week, which is our second part of Michael Kaplan, we will uh, we'll talk to you then. <laughs>Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcasts at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.